seeking grace, we remember God's persistence in saving us. This, this is the place where God will breathe the word into our lives. Let's sing together.
Joys. Let's go with joys. Something good that has happened to you this week or somebody you know. I'm always puzzled. How is it that thank you, Trish? <laughs> Trish comes through in the clutch. Uh, Rob that I work with, he had to have a um, catheterization for his heart. He was all worried, and fortunately, nothing is wrong. So oh, he had a good result in his gap. And Rob, Rob is having all these heart issues as a result of COVID, but he seems to be doing well. So we're praising God that Rob had a positive result from his heart cat, test. from his heart cat test. Yeah. Uh, due to complications that uh, he's had because of COVID. Yeah. Uh, I'd also lift up uh, that the member that we have who is struggling with COVID in the hospital is continuing to improve and hopefully will be discharged soon. So we're praising God for that. Uh, under praise, other praise reports we have for all our blessings, big and small. And thank you so much for being my family in Christ. Thank you for your thoughts. I want to mention that the flowers here uh, this morning in the sanctuary are in memory of Leonard Staley, whose funeral was yesterday, and our condolences continue to be extended to Marlene and to her family, to all the many lives that Leonard touched. Under prayer concerns, we have for Darla with health issues, for Dave Mason, for healing, for those suffering with COVID, for those who are battling cancer, uh, for my family, someone has written. Uh, I would also add, uh, under praise reports for Claire coming home from the hospital and for her recuperation. We just saw her yesterday. First time I saw her since the beginning of the week, and she's getting there, slow but sure, and hopefully feeling better. Uh, I also want to lift up uh, little baby JJ, who's having a procedure done this morning in the hospital. And I want to continue, that we need to continue to pray for Michael Weller, who got good news uh, with regards to his treatment for brain, for a brain uh, cancer and a treatment that seems to be reducing his tumor. So we're praising God for that. Are there other prayer requests this morning? Then let's go to God. God, you are the God of all eternity. And you blessed us with this time here this morning, a time in which we can worship, in which we can pray, in which we can live in faith and faithfulness by your Son and by his Spirit. You're with us in every season of our lives. You've gone before us in every generation. We've known your love who have experienced your mercy, who have accepted your forgiveness, and who have lived out your purpose. And so we thank you, Lord, for how you continue to work through us in this generation to be the faithful witnesses, those offering the gift of mercy, compassion, grace, kindness, Give us grace, Lord, that we might learn from those who have gone before us, and that we might be faithful in this time. Lord, we pray in these days, thinking about perhaps the days of our past, or wondering about the days that are yet to come. Sometimes our bodies are perfectly working in order, we feel like, and other days we are mindful of our mortality. It seems like sometimes our lives are moving at breakneck speed, and we feel like we're heading headlong into what feels fragile. And yet, God, in this glad day, we give you thanks for the sweetness of your gifts. We pray for faith, we pray for hope, we pray for love. We lift up your church and we pray for us as we live out the calling that you have given to us. We 
ask that you would be, allow us to be a place where wounds might be bound up, where people might find healing. In times that pass quickly, we pray that wars would soon end, that fears would be calmed, broken hearts mended, diseases such as the pandemic were in the middle of healed. That the hungry would be fed, the homeless have a place, the restless find peace. That the addict would find freedom, and that grief would pass away, and that joy and laughter would have their day in our lives. We pray this day particularly for Darla and Dave. We give thanks for Ron. We pray for JJ his parents. We lift up Michael. We pray, Lord, for Claire's recuperation. We lift up those who are in the hospital battling COVID or those who are battling cancer. We pray, Lord, for families and for reconciliation and healing. We pray, Lord, for the joys of families, too, that can draw us the best in us. We thank you for all of these things that you've given to us. We come to you as humble servants, offering ourselves by your Holy Spirit, make us willing to answer the prayers that we make. And all our prayers might be made in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray so. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing together, O oh God, our help in the ages past. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, 
that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy like given by the Holy Spirit, and so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turned to God from idols, to serve the Lord, the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we come to you now, we see that you would meet us here, and in your word that you would reveal your truth to us. I would pray, Lord, that you would take these things that I have to say and what is kernels of truth, what are seeds sown for faith, would find deep roots, and the chaff would be blown away and quickly forgotten. Amen. I can relate to the details, though my story was probably slightly different, but the results were the same. It was always a mystery, the man related, that when he was a boy, his mother seemed to learn about his doings in the neighborhood. He'd make a ruckus getting a Slurpee at the 7-Eleven with his friends, and by the time he got home, the Slurpee still unfinished. She was waiting there to hold him to account. Or than going to the friend's house when he would pepper the driveway basketball trash talk with foul words and was grounded. How did she do it? Of course it was his mother's doing the doing. It was Mr. Atkins, the friend's dad, and Frank, the mom's friend, who worked a daily shift at the 7-Eleven, reporting on the public behavior of her son, which at the time seemed like nosy pride to him, but rather appeals as a kind of community accountability. It needn't be all bad. For the church of Thessalonica, it's rather good. People report about us, Paul tells the Christians in the congregation. What kind of welcome we had among you. It's a classic, I heard what you did confrontation, but it's all good. <coughs> but before I get too far, let me give you some background on the occasion of this letter. Thessalonica was an important city in the Roman province of Macedonia. Paul, Silas, and Timothy had taken the gospel there probably sometime in the middle of the 80s, AD 49, AD, AD, middle of the 100, AD 49, 50, something like that. We don't know exactly how long they stayed here. The book of Acts gives us a little bit more in the 17th chapter about their time there. But it was probably at least three weeks we know that they were there, but more likely they were there two or three months. And they faced increasing hostility from the Jewish community and from the local authorities. The most serious charge being the one that Paul heard lots of places that he went, that he was preaching a subversive message, that he was a threat to the emperor. And so as a result, Paul leaves Thessalonica under the cover of darkness, and he goes to the next town, Berea, and then on to Athens. And as while he's at Athens, and he sends Timothy back to Thessalonica to check and see, how are they doing? Has the gospel taken root there? And this letter in our hands is Paul's reaction to Timothy's report to him. These words are very old, ancient. Now scholars differ on all kinds of different things, of course. You can find an argument for everything about scripture. But many of them agree that 1 Thessalonians was probably one of Paul's first epistles, first letters. And since we're certain that it was written before some of the Gospels, 
by a good bit of time. It is possible it is the earliest written document following the ministry of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's the first bit of Christian writing and theology that was reflected ever. And so they're not just old, they're remarkable. Because in this, even, even in this small little bit that I've read this morning, we have the Trinity, references to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The idea of churches, people gathering as the church, as a people that's founded based on the gospel. A theology of the Holy Spirit that's active. That inspires preaching, promotes joy in the hearts of believers, and a doctrine of the resurrection. It's fascinating how Paul expresses his confidence here in the genuine work of God. He says, we know that you were chosen by God. That's a strong statement. What are the unmistakable signs of the genuine work of God. What do you think those are? How can we know that God is truly at work in a person's life or in the life of a local church? In the evangelistic world, there are a number of things that people try to point to as evidence of God being at work. Sometimes they have to do with things that really maybe don't point to the gospel but to other things. Money. Large congregations, enormous buildings, people with best-selling books. Paul doesn't say anything about any of those things. What does he point to? How do we know it's the real deal? Well, Paul links it to the first to the fifth verse. When he says that they didn't receive just words, but also power and the Holy Spirit. And that they were filled with full conviction. The gospel message involves words, propositions about what Jesus has done, but it's more than words that it came in power. Something happened to them, and in them, a power was unleashed, and they believed the gospel with full conviction. And flowing out of that wholehearted embrace of the gospel, Paul mentions in verse 3, their faith, their hope, and their love. But also in verse 6, their commitment to lead exemplary lives. This is probably one of the clearest pictures that we have from the Gospels about how people came from that day in a pagan background to become part of the church of Jesus Christ. You know, after all, let's remember what their world was like. There were gods for literally everything. Greeks and Romans. Paganism was everywhere. If you're going to plant a crop, you pray to the relevant God. If you're going on a quick business trip, you go to the appropriate shrine. If one of your children was getting married, then some serious and costly worship with the relevant deity was required. At every turn in the road, there was a God. Unpredictable, sometimes angry, sometimes gentle. Sometimes it war, supposedly, with one of the other gods. But you couldn't do much other than try to placate them to make sure they were on your side. And so this was a striking proof of the power of the gospel that those in Thessalonica were willing to abandon all of that and suddenly change their views of what power was really at work in the world and what was real and what was true and what had an effect on them, and they had an amazing transformation. Why would they be willing to forsake all those idols? Why would they be willing to overturn that system that they placed their hopes in and do something completely different than they had ever known? Because God had opened their hearts, cracked their hearts open, and then they suddenly realized that the idols do not, could not, would not offer a real solution to what their problems were. And yet, think of all the things that we chase after. The things that we adore and worship. Money, reputation, power, material possessions, accolades at work, beauty, fitness, what will any of those things do for you and I on the moment 
Remember, God judges the secrets of my heart by Christ Jesus. Not a damn lot of them. Not them. They will just be lifeless idols. Powerless to save us from. What were those words at the end? Right there at the very end, they kind of kind of scooted by us because they knew one of them to scoot by. God, uh, who it says, and wait for his son from heaven, who raised, he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming. situation that we are facing if we're left to ourselves. Because then it stirs up in something in us, in a season we're coming into right now, right? Thanksgiving, where we have gratitude. What kind of love is this that God would send his beloved son to take our punishment? We deserve that wrath at the end of the sentence, but instead we got mercy. It reminds us that turning to Christ means we turn away from something. Even as Christians, we're prone to create things, to elevate them, to give them inordinate places. John Calvin, our, one of our big guys from back, theologians from a couple hundred years ago in the Reformed faith, said that the human heart is an idol factor. The human heart is an idol factory. We're mass-producing idols every day. We crank them out one after another. And we put them in places of worship. And we give our hearts to them. And we adore those things. And we cling to them. And we make sacrifices for them. And in so doing, we engage in a direct attack against the God who loves us. Do you see how much deeper the problem of sin is for us? than we typically think it is. When we elevate things to the place that only God deserves, we're telling God, hey, you know, why don't you get down off of your throne so that I can make room for what I want to put there. However, Paul is confident, I already mentioned, that the Thessalonian church had faith, hope, and love. Faith produced by the Holy Spirit that produces good works. God's adopted children loves, love all people. The Spirit encouraged them to love their neighbors with well-being and care. And hope that produces the kind of endurance that you and I need. And they did this in spite of, it says, in spite of severe suffering. The gospel had arisen hostility in Thessalonica, but that opposition didn't deter them. That force coming against them didn't say, we're going to change our minds and go back the other way. It said, no, we're going to keep going forward. Because we know what it means when we've been saved. And so the Thessalonican church were able to welcome the gospel, not begrudgingly, but with joy. And wherever they went by the Spirit, they were able to have joy. And they became imitators. The Holy Spirit transformed their lives. And they became examples, so much so that Paul points that out to both the people around them. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, not just the people of Macedonia, but everywhere we're learning, they were hearing. And you think, you know, I thought yesterday, I thought, well, gee, they didn't have the internet. How are they hearing? That means the story was the top line, headline news. If you were carrying it from one place to another, journeying from one place to another, you weren't posting it on the newspaper because there was no newspaper. You weren't having it on CNN or whatever news channel you watch, because there wasn't one. It went by word of mouth, but they were known because of their faith. What a mind-blowing thing it is for us to think about, because one of the reasons that you and I are here today is because of the faith. 
faith of the people who were before us, who spoke the word, who said something to you whenever you were a kid, or maybe met you when you were an adult, and said something that changed your perspective about how you saw life. You see, they heard the gospel, but they also shared it. They didn't just let that loud noise echo around. They let it be broadcast to the whole known world. So they became known everywhere. You know, such, wit such witnessing doesn't have to be particularly imaginative. By God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, just sharing simple things about our faith can have a dramatic effect on someone else. To have them become adopted as a son and a daughter of Jesus Christ. There's signs of what God is doing in the Spirit's work. After all, they show God drawing us towards himself in faith. By God's amazing grace and spirit, God transforms us so that we serve not idols, but the living God. God frees us from slavery, Satan, and death, and puts us to work in God's loving, willful service. It's not enough just to hear the gospel. It's not even enough to pass it on and to empower missionaries and do that through testimonies. We have to be modeling our lives on what we believe and what the scripture tells us and says. And when we read these verses today, it's hard not to see how they square directly with where our church tradition has gotten us to. That what these earliest people believed the church still believes. But it was so dear to them that they suffered for it. It was so dear to them that they were persecuted for it. It was so dear to them that they died for it. You know, you don't stake your life on vague claims, but on ultimate matters of life, death, salvation, and the future. But in the end, it was all so simple. These words Paul spoke were not just noisy vibrations in the air. They had power. They had oomph. And by the Spirit, those words changed lives. Hearts melted. People fell in love with Jesus Christ, who was not just a concept or a shadowy figure from recent history. He was personal to them in a way that was undeniable. They stake their lives on this truth. It was all really so simple. Centuries, even millennia later, it need be no more complicated than that right now. What it comes down to is we need to know how to live joyful, hope filled lives in the face of troubled, difficult times with suffering. And the Thessalonians knew that. They knew that centuries before Bibles were printed, or hymnals were available, or catechisms were formed together, or there was Sunday school curriculum that God the Father had raised Jesus from the dead to live, deliver us from sin, to deliver us from evil, and that by the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, Working in you today. That's what the Spirit is doing. He's working in you today. We patiently wait for Christ's return, but we do more than that. We are joyfully passionate and boldly speaking the words of life. That's the gospel. It was the gospel then, just like it is this morning. Just like it always will be. And to God be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what's that song say? Can I get a witness?
Thank you for your witness to us from our fellow believers over 2,000 years ago. Thank you for their words of hope, faith, and love. Thank you for their words that you were able to look at by your Holy Spirit. They were able to become imitators. But we don't want to just hear their story. Lots of people can hear a story. We want to enact that in our lives. We want people to be able to see that. If we want to be known for anything, we want to be known because we are a burning bright witness to who you are and what you can do. Not to bring any glory to ourselves, but to point exclusively to you. And so in our lives, in our everyday decisions, meet us there. By your spirit, convict us. Put the words in our mouth when that's the right thing to do to say to witness. Put the action in our lives when that's what we need to reflect. And let's be bold. And even in the midst of moments of difficulty, let's be joyful because we know who the King is. And our Savior. Amen. Would you join me as we affirm our faith? We are a community of faith. We believe in God, the Creator, the Almighty, who made everything that is, and saw that it was good. We believe in God, the Redeemer, Jesus of Nazareth, who was in history, lived among us, healed the afflicted, taught, suffered, and died. He forgave those who crucified him. The incarnation of love, the Christ, he shows us the way, saying, Whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. It is the way of love, compassion, justice, forgiveness, and peace. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, the giver of life, the holy wisdom, who inspires the people of God to cry out for justice for the powerless and oppressed, to see the presence of God in everything he created, and to respond with love. We are reborn in the Spirit, followers of that way shown by Jesus, to love God with our whole being, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to treat ourselves as we would have them treat us, to strive for justice and peace, to have respect and compassion for every person, to forgive those who do us harm, to love one another as Christ loved us. We journey together on this way towards reconciliation, we break bread together and pray together. This is our community. This is our faith. Let's close our service today by singing, Jesus Shall Reign.
from here, from this place, fortified for the journey, reminded of how and who you are loved by, and sustained and directed by the power of that same Spirit. Go now with the blessings of God the Father who has loved you and known you and had great plans for you from the very beginning. Go with the blessings of Jesus Christ who saved you, who loves you, who comes alongside you in the times where you feel the most desperate, but also right in the moments of the greatest joy. And go with the power of the Holy Spirit that reaches into us and draws us, that compels us to step forward in acts of faith and trust.